Hey, Inspired Money Maker. Today's guests, Joe and Emily, say personal finance can be a lot more fun than you think. Funny money? Let's find out. Episode 221 features Joe Saul Sihai and Emily Guy Birkin, authors of Stack. How much better is it to say, how much do I value this versus these other desires that I have? What's most important? What's second most important? What's third? And when you put it all out visually against each other, and start having these goals push and pull against each other, you end up with much better conversations, better tracking with milestones along the way, um, and a better investment strategy that you can can stick with when things get bad because you know why you're in the investment you're in. I'm Andy Wong, host of the Inspired Money Podcast and financial advisor at Runnymede Capital Management. Today, we have not one guest, but two. You may know Joe as the creator and co-host of the Stacking Benjamins podcast. He's highly visible in the personal finance space as a speaker, MC, host, contributor, and coach. Joe has even invited me and my music to a couple Stacking Benjamins events. It's always a fun time. Emily's a lifelong money nerd, Plutus award-winning freelance writer, money coach, blogger, and retirement expert. She has written several books. Together, Joe and Emily have teamed up to write Stack, your super serious guide to modern money management. They advocate a basic philosophy of money that'll help you live bigger, be bolder, and laugh harder. In this episode, you'll learn money mistakes to avoid, how to effectively timeline your goals, and tune in to the end to hear Joe talk about budget meetings, and he'll share insights from having twins in college. Now let's get inspired with Joe Salcihai and Emily Guy Birkin. Emily and Joe, welcome to Inspired Money. It's so great to have you on the show. Thank I you am for having us. So happy to be here, Andy. <laughs> Joe, you've been here, so I'm going to ask Emily, what's your earliest childhood memory of money? Ooh, um, I don't know if it was my earliest, but one of the the like the most potent memories um, was I was about ten or eleven years old, and um, my dad's friend hired me to be a mother's helper um, for an afternoon while she took care of stuff. And I, I, I don't remember like I, I sat with the baby basically, um, and so and she paid me five dollars. And she lived in the same neighborhood. And so I was walking home with that $5. And I like the, in my head, there was just like, next stop, world domination. <laughs> it was so exciting to me. It was just like, I did work and I got paid for it. And this is my money and I can do anything I want with it. <laughs> Uh, and so there was, yeah, there, that was just very heady that, that sense of like, I can earn money and, um, something that I do is considered valuable. Um, and I, that, that really stuck with me. And then you opened up an agency of mother's <laughs> helpers. Uh, no, but I did start babysitting pretty regularly. <laughs> well, I'm very excited to have you guys on. I, I want to talk about this book that I don't have, but. I have in my iPad <laughs> that Joe sent me, I think two days ago. <laughs> we finally, we finally have hard copies. We were told by the way, by our publisher, we were told by our publisher that, uh, we, we, we nearly didn't have a launch day because of supply chain stuff. Oh, wow. And so just, just and, getting it. And but they, there waited is... to, they waited to tell us until after the danger had passed for which I am very grateful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I I would have been a little upset. <laughs> How long ago did you guys start collaborating and decide that you're going to work on this project together? When did I when did I write to you or call you, Emily? I think that was uh, summer of 2018. I'm yeah, pretty sure I'm pretty sure it was 2018. Um, yeah. Uh, so because. Uh, um, it took us, it took us a quite a while to, uh, um, to get all our ducks in a row. 
it took us a full year because of other priorities to do the, um, to, to just put the, uh, the pitch together mm -hmm. and to figure out how we were going to publish. Um, and we, when we decided on traditional publishing that, uh, to find an agent and then our agent ripped up the book pretty good. And then we both got excited about other things. And, uh, and then it, I think it took me three months to convince Emily, I was actually ready to, to rebegin. And then when we did, we, we really stormed into it from that point forward. Like from that point forward, we were, we were a rocket ship, but the, the idea actually started, Andy, I was in Portland, Oregon, and I was at this bookstore Powell's. You familiar with Powell's? Sure. Yeah. Famous. It, just this great bookstore for people who haven't been there. It's like a block long and it's, uh, it's, you can get lost in there and for creative people, like you and Emily and I, it's just a great place to get inspiration. So you'll find this shocking, Andy, knowing me for a little while. I'm in the kids section, right? <laughs> and and I, I, I see this book that I carried around and dog-eared. And, and I just, I, this was the most amazing book. It was the Hardy Boys Detective Manual. And it was written with the help of a real live retired FBI agent. It said that right at the beginning of the book. And my brother and I, we studied how to be a detective from this book. Like my dad on a muddy day would go to work at General Motors and we would go look at the tire tracks and see, you know, analyze those to see what type of tires the perpetrator might have had, you know, my dad. <laughs> And speaking of sketchy, we couldn't just track him. We had to track my mom, too. When she would touch a door handle, we'd go over there with the tape and uh, tape the door handle to get the, to get her fingerprints because you're not sure what mom's doing. But it was really fun. And I thought, man, if there was a book like that for adults about money, but written kind of in that campy style, that would be good. So that was the germ. But it really came to fruition when we flew home. I was living in Detroit at the time and uh, unlocked the door. My mom has a key to our house and she had left us. I was 50 years old at the time, 50. And my mom finally gave me the crap out of the attic that, that, that she'd been keeping. You know, she could finally trust me with that father, son bowling invitational uh, sixth place, uh, little <laughs> tiny trophy with the arm broken off. Uh, I got that. I got my little league stuff, but, but a, a, an important thing that was in there was the Cub Scout wolf guide. And I wasn't in scouts for a long time, but the, the, the wolf guide is I was leafing through this and I really like these FinTech apps that gamify things. I think they're incredibly creative. They take some of this difficult stuff and by gaming, by gamifying it, they make it fun. Um, I realized that the Cub Scouts were gamifying m way before these these app creators were. Uh, every, quote, chapter was instead an achievement. And to get the achievement, they told you the tools you were going to need. Then they showed you succinctly how to do the thing. At the bottom, there were check boxes to show proficiency. Do this, do this, do this. And if you did all those things, there was a place on the bottom for your mom to sign it. And then you got your badge. So we, that by the way, was the pitch that we made to Penguin Random House who ended up purchasing the book from us and, and working with us on it and their wonderful team. But, but the other places, we went on this tour with our agent with the book, every tour stop ended with, so what I want to do is, is Emily and I, we'd love to take the Hardy Boys Detective Manual meets the Cub Scout Wolf Guide but for adults and about money. And we were sure, you know, it's in the middle of COVID then we were sure they were going to stop the zoom call. Like it was going <laughs> to, things were over, but, but luckily they, they liked it. And I think it's because, you know, this is a very serious topic, but in some ways I think you know, shows like yours, we need to find ways to be inspired and to lighten it up a little bit and, uh, and, and relax so that we actually do the important things it takes to get ahead. Well, it's stacked. Your super serious guide to modern money management. Is the super serious? Is that tongue in cheek? Emily? Uh, not at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. It is, uh, we, it's one of those things where anytime you have to describe yourself as something, it's not that. Yeah. So when, when you're like, I am a professional <laughs> in the same way, like, this book is super serious. If you have to say it, you know, it's not really. <laughs> 
<laughs> which, which which was funny, Emily. I mean, uh, you know, we got uh, we were told that we should have a subtitle, and they the, the I think it was the Penguin team who who suggested they're like you should put so people are ready for the humor in this book. You mm-hmm. should put your hilarious guide to money management. And to Emily's point, if you say the word hilarious, it's not hilarious. Mm-hmm. Like it is not. So yeah, we went uh, we went with super serious, Andy. <laughs> And and we did put it in uh we put it in in the uh italics, italics you know, yes. sarcasm font. Yes. <laughs> just like just like the Hardy Boys, if readers are detectives, they might catch on they might catch on to us. <laughs> so Emily, were you on board right away? Because this seems to like go back to Joe's childhood. Like <laughs> with the Hardy Boys and then the Cub Scout book. Uh yeah, it was so when he called me to to tell me about the idea, um, I was immediately on board, um, and for a couple of reasons. One is Joe is so much fun to work with. So, like, just if if he had suggested even something that didn't sound as interesting, I, I would have been like, well, I love working with Joe. Um, but also the the idea itself sounded really really interesting because there's a lot of stuff in there that fits with my own view of money, like the gamification and, uh, you know, taking people through things in a way that feels uh, more fun than the very, this is serious and we have serious things to do with our serious money. Um, and then the the third reason why I was super excited about it is I try to include a little bit of humor in everything that I write. That's just kind of the way that I look at the world. Um, it's, I, I already kind of tamp down on it a bit and then my editors often end up having to take it out and so the idea uh, the creative challenge of being like not only do you have to tamp not tamp down your humor you can just let it go and go and be as funny as you can possibly be while still getting the point across that was going to be such a fun creative challenge and I actually so enjoyed writing this specifically thinking like this is going to make Joe crack up. So like, because I was writing for a very specific audience, I was writing for Joe. And so as I'm writing things and like putting jokes in and making puns and stuff like that, I'm like, Oh, he's going to think this is so funny. And that was just so much fun. And in some ways a lot easier than other times I've tried to write humor. Cause I was writing for a specific audience. I did laugh when, um, you know, you, you say things like you're tired of Joe's, corn analogies <laughs> um, since he grew up on a farm and yeah talk a little bit about that because joe you have a very popular podcast when you're writing are you trying to write for each other or are you trying to think about your listener and what a book might be able to supplement like how that might be able to supplement your podcast yeah uh, i'm actually writing for me um, I'm writing this thing that I would have wanted to read before I knew about money. And then you hope that enough people are like you and the crazy way you think about things that there might be, you know, a group of people who, who will respond to this. Cause I needed, I need a big time help Andy with my money. I was a money disaster. I mean, I, I walked into uh, college when, when I first got to the Citadel by the way, the Citadel, the Military College of South Carolina, this will be an important part of this story, is uh, I walk into Mark Clark Hall, the student union, on the second day, and there's a line out the door. Colleges can't do this anymore, but they still find a way to get college students to get credit too early. Uh, and it's an American Express line to get an American Express card. And I don't remember if it was a beach towel or a Frisbee. It wouldn't have been a toaster <laughs> because we're college students, but it was some cool thing that we all wanted. And uh, so I got in the line. Once again, Andy, I'm in military college. I have no way to have a job. I cannot have a job. I, I'm i marching when I'm not in class. I'm marching and learning how to shoot my weapon and clean my weapon and all that stuff. And and But, of course, two weeks later after I applied, my shiny new green card comes in the mail. Remember since that day? Super excited that I had it. And the first time we got leave, we went to this mall in North Charleston, and it was maybe – six or or seven of us and we're at this table at this high high end restaurant i'm not sure if you've heard of this place but it's very high end it was called ruby tuesday it was this <laughs> incredible place and they had a set 
Oh, well, they had us. The fact they had a salad bar, it was, yeah, I was in Michelin heaven. Michelin star. <laughs> but to show, to show my friends, to show my, the different Michelin, the tire people. Yeah. Yes. The tire people gave it a star because they all go there after the shift uh, for a couple beers and the salad bar. But they, they, uh, after when the bill came just to show everybody what a baller I was, I flash that card that I've had for, you know, two weeks, three weeks and go, I got this. This is on me guys. And everybody thought I was super cool because I picked up their high end meal. Well, then we wander down to the other end of the mall and there's a Nordstrom and I should have worn it today for people watching the video. I just have Mickey mouse on today, but, um, but I had, uh, there was on a mannequin, this very expensive sweater at Nordstrom and the year is 1986 and this sweater was Duran Duran incredible. It was awesome. It was like this paisley thing. It was this around the collar and then a uh, purple, this like bright purple color that, that is, was great in the eighties. And, uh, and I bought it. So two things, number one, I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. You need a sweater like both days that it gets cold. <laughs> And then the second thing is I'm in a military college, AD. I can't even wear a sweater. Like there's no way I can wear a sweater, but it didn't stop me. I, uh, I buy them. I put them on the credit card. And then the weirdest thing happened like three weeks later, I go down to get my mail. Cause this is, you know, pre-internet and I go to get my mail and there's this letter from American express. I'm like, Oh, this is cool. This is awesome. And it was the weirdest thing. It was this bill where they said I owed this money for this stuff I bought. And, and, and to be clear, I had never considered this. Like this was, this was nowhere when I, when I pick, bought this stuff, I didn't think about I was going to have to pay for it. So I did what any sane person would do. You know, I called my mom and I said, mom, we've, we've got a problem. And mom said, no, you've got a problem. And she refused to pay it. And at 18 years old, about, uh, what, three months later, the credit card was gone and my uh, credit was wrecked. And I spent the whole next summer working with a collection agency to, to pay it back. Sounds like fun. I think, I think we need to, I think the point of that weird story was that, was that we, you know, we need to, we need to reach those people. There are lots of people like me. Lots of people have made that same or similar mistake. And, and, uh, and I felt that a goofy, goofy, fun, relaxed analogy, like the corn analogy, you know, when it comes to <laughs> investing or that analogy, when it comes to debt, I think, I think are things that kind of calm it down and make it so that the average person understands just, it's okay. If you, if, if you come from a place like I did of being completely not knowing any of this stuff. Well, kudos well, just... to you for being classy, for treating <laughs> all your friends and going to Nordstrom. Like right, you don't, right. You know, you, you start at the top. I wasn't going to hot topic. Yeah, this was you weren't you weren't wasting it on ski ball. <laughs> That's right. It was eighty six. You weren't ready for yeah. I was yeah, just thinking about yeah. that hot topic wasn't even around in eighty six. <laughs> so you weren't ready for alternative yet. No, <laughs> That's right. Well, it, just to just to jump on that as well. Um, so my my most recent book before this one was called End Financial Stress Now. And I specifically was writing it for people who feel overwhelmed by money and also feel like they're shut out of financial conversations because they don't understand the acronyms. They like everything feels opaque. And I was talking to a friend of mine who was saying, like, I need to read your book, but I'm scared to. She's like, I'm scared. I'm not going to understand it. Um, and or, you know, scared that it would make her feel ashamed for, for not being further along or anything like that. And so that's the other thing that I think is, is really important about making a book about money playful and have humor in it is that it, it can make it clear, like, there's nothing to be worried about here. Um, you know, we're, we're here to, we're going to enjoy ourselves while we do this. And this is not anything where you have to worry about shame or blame or that, uh, you know, we're going to throw acronyms at you and expect you to understand them or, you know, throw numbers at you and expect you, expect you to understand how we came to those numbers. So that's one of the things that I really appreciate about it. But I also, one of the things I also really like is that it doesn't, our book doesn't assume that there's an end point to what you can learn. So even if you're, you're coming into it knowing very little, we take you all the way from like setting goals and making budgets to um, the efficient frontier with investing. 
So recognizing like anyone can learn this and wherever you are on this financial journey, you know, you've got your budget down pat, but you're like nervous about investing. Uh, you've got investing basics, but you don't know how to do like the 201 stuff. We have all of that in there so that it can um, help people at any point in their journey, um, no matter how intimidated they might feel or how they might feel like, well, I do know this, but I wish I understood better. Well, I like that it's accessible because you're not putting yourself out there as two gurus, you know, at the top of the mountain, speaking down to the people. You're very open about the mistakes you've made, Joe. Emily, I understand that your dad was a financial planner and mm -hmm. that you liked counting money as a kid. <laughs> Did you have like glaring mistakes that you can share with us of things not to do? Um. So the, my, my biggest mistake is probably, uh, my tattoo. <laughs> um, uh, that's and that's not in the book. I don't think it, it is. <laughs> oh, I missed it. <laughs> well, it's, it, it, that's the thing about us getting it to you two days ago. <laughs> yeah. Is it yeah. is, it is back in the book. It's, it's, it's toward the end. And there's a picture. Um, we have a picture. There, there is a picture for, for proof. Um, so I have always been, um, very particular about my money. I've always counted it. I've always tracked it. Um, even when I made very little money. Um, and so, um, I never had like the, the Ruby Tuesday Nordstrom type moment, um, that Joe had, but, um, I did have a similar one that in some ways has longer lasting repercussions because it had to do with actual body modification. <laughs> And that was, uh, so in 2002, I was, uh, dating this guy who was just no good and he broke up with me and it made me sad. And about two weeks later, my grandmother passed away and I was mad at myself for being sad about this jabroni dumping me when my grandmother, who I really, really loved and was close to was so much, was worth so much more. Um, and worth my tears. And so to remind myself to save my tears for things that really matter, I was like, I'm going to get a teardrop tattoo on my back. And so I spent $150 that I couldn't afford um, and got a teardrop tattoo. It's stylized. So it doesn't even really necessarily look like a teardrop. It looks like uh, friends have said it looks a little like an alien sperm. <laughs> which did not make it in the book that fact <laughs> that, that that analogy would have been cut anyway <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> um and it took me 10 minutes after walking out of uh the the tattoo parlor 150 dollars uh um uh poorer and permanent ink on my body for me to go what have i done um and that's uh now the the financial fallout of it was relatively minor. I mean, I I, um, I had to you know eat peanut butter and jelly and ramen for for a few weeks rather than my usual groceries um, because of of how much it cost. But the but cultural fallout is way worse, <laughs> way worse. <laughs> well, because I didn't realize until several months later that it. Teardrop tattoo is a gangland symbol for having murdered someone. <laughs> so my tattoo that I got in the wake of my grandmother's death seems to say that I whacked grandma. <laughs> I, I learned a couple things here today. <laughs> you don't mess with Emily. So do you still have this tattoo? I do. Yes. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, before I got the tattoo years ago, I met someone who had a really badly thought out tattoo. Um, it was a, like a leopard or something. It was a black big cat. Um, and uh, he was saying how much he hated it. And I said, why don't you get it, get, get it removed? You know, they, they do that. And he's like, that's just throwing good money after bad. And uh, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, if I could, it's on my, it's on my, uh, my right shoulder on the back. Um, if I could see it, I'd probably be more likely to be like, yeah, I need to get this removed, <laughs> but since I can't see it. It's, but the fact that everybody else it. can see it, but not her. <laughs> well, and they, they know that it means I'm a badass. That's so right. <laughs> you don't mess with me. <laughs> That's why people tiptoe around Emily. Yes. Yeah. But before a fight, you have to rip your shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> True. <Yeah. laughs> 
Although, doesn't that also kind of like intimidate you? <laughs> right. If you immediately go, ha! <laughs> Before a fight. <laughs> That's how the book truly got made, Andy. Emily came to me and said, hey, we're making a book together, Joe. I'm like, no, I don't think so. Then she showed me a tattoo on her back, and I'm like, yeah, we're making a book. Yeah, cool. Let's do it. Sounds like a great project. Yeah, your manuscripts were always delivered on time. <laughs> day early. A day early. With chocolate. That's right. Please don't hurt I, me, Miss I've Perkin. never thought of a tattoo as like a regrettable financial decision. But yeah, it's I didn't uh, think about it in the terms of money, that's why. Well, and it's 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 one of those things um if I had been thinking about it, well, because I did think about it money wise, like I, I, I knew where the money was coming from. I knew what the consequences would be. Um, and I have always been a very quick decision maker. So I, I make a decision, I engage the decision and I don't look back. Um, and that has served me very well for most of my life with one very notable exception. <laughs> um, and I remember talking to a friend of mine about it um, when she she saw my tattoo for the first time. She's like, I'm, I'm surprised you have that. And I told her the story and she's like, I did that once too. And she and I are very similar in how we handle money. She's like, she bought a sports car and she, because she similarly would make quick decisions like and, and felt very confident about them. It was when she was driving it off the lot. She was just like, why did I just do that? Yeah. Um, and so and I think that's pretty common among people who um, do generally make um, sound financial decisions and feel like they, they have learned to trust their own instincts. There will be a time where you go like, oh, oh, wait, no, I should have taken more time with this one. <laughs> We do we do cover that, and both Emily and I have seen that a lot, not just in our personal lives, but also in our professional lives, that people that uh, make snap decisions often need to have a shock absorber. You have to figure out a system, especially on big purchases, to give you that let's sleep on it for a second because I know myself and I know that I like to make these decisions quickly, but there's also the counterpoint that Emily talks about because she did the heavy lifting on this particular chapter, which is the, um, which is, you know, analysis paralysis. We all know people that just get so paralyzed. They do nothing. And often in many cases, doing nothing is worse than, than doing the thing that moves you forward. Maybe it's 80%, 75%, 80% right, but at least it's moving you forward where in a lot of cases just being completely paralyzed does does nothing and in that case you have to look at what's the worst case scenario and then um and then give yourself a time limit and you know I'm going to decide by x time knowing myself that I'm going to move forward on this yeah it's it's tough finding that balance sometimes yeah. because mm -hmm. everybody sort of has their has their leaning right based on their personality um yeah, buying my first car took like many, many months. I was, I was like researching mm -hmm. horsepower and cost, and like <laughs> which which model do I, what car do I want? And uh, yeah, it was kind of crazy. <laughs> you you would get along with my husband, who uh, he we've been in this house for five and a half years, and uh, he just ordered curtains for our kitchen just now <laughs> this weekend. <laughs> Because he's been thinking about it all this time about what what he wants and and how he wants it to look and how much he wants to spend and all of those things and I I am much more like you know I want it done I want it done <laughs> and so that that can lead me astray in the same way that him having kind of analysis paralysis can lead him astray and one of the reasons why we work well together is he forces me to slow down I force him to speed up so I think like this book is so important because. Most of us don't get enough personal finance in school, right? That's why you can help like the younger Joe, because there, there just aren't enough classes teaching the basics. It's so overwhelming for people. Where do you tell people to start? You know, it's like, how, I want to be better. I want to be better with my money. Where do I start? The place, the place to start, and this is a hard one because not knowing where people are uh, right now in your journey makes it difficult for us as, as, uh, as guides to show you where to start. But I think for everybody, one common universal place that I think we all need, and we need it much closer to the beginning than the end, is we need, we need to 
do this thing that Stephen Covey talks about, which is begin with the end in mind. If we're setting out no matter where we are, when I was a financial planner, Andy, and, I, and I'm sure you have seen this as, as well in the business, you saw people often buying investments for the wrong reason that did not fit the goal and that it was it didn't really make them bad investments. It just wasn't good for what they were trying to achieve. So people having the wrong thing. And the way to avoid that is to, is to start off with that, advice you see everywhere, which is starting with your goals. Well, the problem is, is that, you know, and we're here around New Year's time, right? And, and I think that the problem is you see how often that doesn't work. People either don't do it or they write down their goals. And then a month later, the goal doesn't work. The way that always worked for me when I was a, when I was a financial planner was to make your goals visual because we live in a visual world and you need your unconscious mind working on this. And I would do this in a way called timelining your goals with my clients. And I think that this is the place for everybody to, to uh, begin because of the fact also that not only does it get your subconscious mind working on it, but it also brings up these wonderful values discussion because often we're, we're focused on things that really aren't important to us. And we're not focusing on the things that truly are and timelining your goals will also help with that. So let me show you how it works. Let's say that you're starting off at the start of this book and you're 40 years old or 35 years old. You put yourself on the left end of this timeline and then you draw a line, which is going to be you from the time that you, to the time you die, which is on the other side of this piece of paper. And then just start putting circles where your goals are. So if you want to be financially independent by age 55, make that a circle that goes through the rest of your life. And that one circle alone, by the way, brings up some things before we get to the really cool stuff, brings up a couple of things. Number one is how much money do I need to save to make that happen? And often I used to go into companies and talk to people about their 401ks and I'd say, how much money are you putting into your 401k? Well, I'm doing 6%. Why is that? Well, they match 6%. Great. That's cool. Where's that going to get you? And the answer nearly every time was, oh, I don't really know. I got, it's better. It is better than yesterday, but I still don't know where it is. So the first question is to reach that specific goal directionally, how much do we have to put away? And then what rate of return does that money need to earn uh, uh, to make that goal happen? But then because we're visuals, then we put all these things. Cause if, you know, if I'm 40 now or 35 now, and I want to retire at 55, there's gonna be a lot of other circles, a lot of other dreams between now and then maybe I have kids. I want to help through college. Maybe I want a second home. Maybe I just want to travel more. I want to change jobs. I want to go back to school, whatever these things are. I put those goals on at the dates that I want them. And I do the same thing. What is it going to cost? How much do I need to save? What rate of return do I need on that money? And it helps me set up these separate buckets. But then the coolest part of this that visualizing does and timelining does that writing down your goals does not do is we begin to see how these interplay with each other. And I begin to have values conversations. Like, let's say I can't get both goals. I can't, I can't put my child through college 100%, pay for 100% of it and retire at 55 is it more important for me value wise that I pay a hundred percent of college and retire when I want, or is it more important for me to maybe have junior pay for part of it? And, and, uh, uh, uh and I, maybe I push back, you know, maybe there's a middle ground somewhere. I don't know what it is. Maybe I push back retirement. Maybe I save less for college. Maybe, maybe the, the, the rate of return I need to get this goal. Maybe I'm not comfortable with those investments. Well, if I back down the risk tolerance, the risk level that I'm taking, I'm going to end up having to save more money. So I start having these fantastic conversations that also not only do we miss with writing down goals, but a lot of people use these rules of thumb. Like you and I, we get asked about rules of thumb all the time, Andy, which is, you know, what do you think about the, you know, it's not even the 4% rule anymore, is it? It's like the 3.3% rule or whatever it is. But whatever that rule is, people use that as shorthand or, you know, the fire movement people use a 25X rule. Those are fine. And directionally, they'll get you there. But how much better is it to say, how much do I value this? versus these other desires that I have. What's most important? What's second most important? What's third? And when you put it all out visually against each other, 
and start having these goals push and pull against each other, you end up with much better conversations, better tracking with milestones along the way, um, and a better investment strategy that you can can stick with when things get bad because you know why you're in the investment you're in. Yeah, one of the circles that I find a little mystifying and a little bit scary is cost of college because extrapolating out 10 years, I honestly, I mean, sure, you can guesstimate how much it's going to cost. That scares me though. <laughs> At the same time, I say, I have no idea how much college is going to cost. Well, and that's hard, right? Because inflation has been so high. I'll, I'll tell you something, putting twins through college is – one cool thing that most parents don't realize when they look at the cost of college is food and board are, are going to be for a lot of people, a part of that. Maybe not, maybe they stay at home, but if it, if it is food and, and if it is room and board, part of that's going to be a cost transfer. And that was a surprise to me. And I'll tell you, my son was captain of the swim team in high school. It, that kid can eat more than I can buy. <laughs> And by the way, he's super thin. He is, he's, he's not tall. He, the, but the kid has a metabolism that just, I would kill for. Like it just, <laughs> it drives me crazy. I love my son so much and I'm so jealous of his metabolism, but he also is, can, can, he puts a huge dent in my grocery budget that when he went to college, all of a sudden Cheryl and I were like, we have money. <laughs> we have <laughs> We have so much. My buy a sports car. My now. checking account is filling up with money. What is this? And I realize it's Nick's not home. And by the way, he has a twin, and we kind of expected a little bit from her. But 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 the cost of Nick was so high that I think I got the good end of that. Like the college is like, oh, here's the cost of food. I'm like, I won that deal. He's gonna, he's he's your problem now, University of Texas. So, but but that cost transfer, I don't think we we prepare for. And I, I ended up having an easier time with college, even with twins, than I than I thought that I was. It was still scary, don't get me wrong, and it was tight for that time frame, but that cost transfer really was uh, was a surprise. You mentioned budget, you know, enjoying the fact that Nick was no longer a part of the household budget, at least for his um, daily eating. Do you guys both have regular budget meetings. I noticed that that that's in the book. And, um, how do you guys handle that? Before we, before we answer that, by the way, this is one of my favorite jokes in the book. And it's one of the early jokes that Emily and I talked about. And it's this like 1950s mother and son. And the chapter's called you're changing budget and you like those videos you had to watch, or at least we had, I had, I don't know if you had to watch these, but these education videos about your voice is cracking. And mom, I'm setting up my first budget. My voice cracked. And mom says, that's okay. It's just your changing budget. It happens to everybody. It's all right. But anyway, Emily, do you do, do you do, do you do meetings? Um, we do not do regular budget meetings. Um, I am like the budget maven in, in my house. Um, I actually, I've got a ridiculous um, Excel spreadsheet where I track all of our spending in a rainbow color spreadsheet. Um, uh, and I, I keep track of all of that. I've been doing that since December, 2014. Um, and the theoretically we meet at the end of every month, we print out the previous month's uh, um, uh, tracking and all of that. And we go over it together. Like I know what everything is, but just to, you know, keep my husband in the loop, make sure he knows what everything is. Um, so we can have kind of a sense of, anything that's upcoming, anything, um, uh, any expenditures that were out of the, the ordinary, that sort of thing. Um, in practice, we don't end up doing that every month, um, in part because uh, he just finds it a little bit boring. <laughs> Whereas I'm like, yay, it's time for a budget meeting. Oh, come on, let's have our budget meeting. And he's like, uh, okay, let me get some coffee. <laughs> so, um, so, but part of that is because we, you know, we've been married for thir 13, 13 years. <laughs> I had to do the math in my head. So we've been married for 13 years together for 18. Um, and so we have, through all of that time, we've worked out a system that works for us um, um, where 
I take on the bulk of the, the, the financial work. I make sure I leave a trail of breadcrumbs. If God forbid the bus should come for me one day, you would be able to figure out what I do. <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, I'm, I'm not doing all the track. I'm like, I wouldn't expect you to, but just so you know what's happening, where money is, how I have it categorized and stuff like that. So I try to leave trail of breadcrumbs so he knows what we have, where it is and, and where the bills are and stuff like that. Um, but because I, like, I truly enjoy doing it, um, that we found that that works really well for us. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's how we, we move forward. If he were more, um, more interested in having a hands-on, um, uh, position with the, with our budgeting, uh, we would have figured out a different way and I'm sure we would meet more often. And f for us, the, the problem was exactly the opposite. I mean, Emily and her husband, uh, are, uh, are on the same page money wise. And Cheryl and I really weren't, and we were having these disagreements and it was mostly caused by a lack of talking through it. It wasn't the wrong spreadsheet or the wrong app. It was just the fact that we didn't communicate, which was about money. We communicate about other things, but what, what would it resulted in is while we were trying to turn our financial ship around and get the house in order, money was really tight and we needed every dollar on board going to the right place. And because we had differing priorities and we didn't talk, we would both come home with things that were super important to the family. Like, you know, uh, Cheryl would come home with school clothes for our young twins and I would come home with the latest video game, like both super important to the family, but, <laughs> but, but we didn't have it's super serious. Yeah. But, yeah, but we, does, does sarcasm play on the radio? I don't know. But, uh, uh, we, we would end up then having these money arguments, you know, and she would, I mean, it, and so that was the downside on me. The downside on her was that she'd go grocery shopping and it was back in the DVD days, uh, before streaming and we we had you know the the video place down the road where you could rent a video and she'd always buy it at the end of the grocery store aisle and then watch it one time and pay 20 bucks instead of, you know whatever amount of money versus just renting it one day um and so we would always have these priority fights and so for us we had to find a way to make it fun and the way to make it fun was we set a timer at 20 minutes we just look through how we spent money the week before it's it's th this is not this is what works for us and you're going to tweak it for yourself but we look through the expenses we talk through our expenses the next week and we always make sure we do it over wine or pancakes depending on what time of day it is like and, and we get excited about it now uh, and the cool thing is is that even though we have a mandatory stop at 20 minutes when we have it, which is, I'm going to say about 85% of the time we have the weekly meeting. When we have it, we have these fantastic organic discussions about money the rest of the week. And I'll bet our quote 20 minute meeting turns into two and a half hours of financial talk. When we don't have it, zero is still zero uh, a week later. So, um, so that's why it works for, for us. They're like 20 minutes. It's like six minute ads. It's exactly. <laughs> I love that. And did you see, did you see that movie? The, 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 whatever, where the guy's like, I got the new deal. Five minute abs. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's six minutes. It's six minutes. That extra minute makes all the difference. <laughs> I got the new 19 minute, but Andy's going to come out with the 19 minute, minute budget meeting. <laughs> Where you can have wine and pancakes at the That's same right. time. That's right. He's going to go beer and straw. beer and pancakes. Way better. <laughs> well, I love that the book has four parts, and you mentioned everything from tracking your money, budgeting your money, to efficient frontier. I have to quote this one line because it jumped out at me, and then maybe you guys can talk amongst yourselves. Just like there's a difference between getting busy in making sweet love, it's time we drew a line between the words saving and investing. <laughs> Who wrote that one? That was that was Joe. Yeah, that, was, that one that one was me. <laughs> <laughs> there was, that was that was all Joe. <laughs> but but I, and, and that was a joke. That was a joke. That the second I wrote it, I stood up. I remember I go right to my phone and I text Emily, and I'm like, I just wrote the 
effing most funny thing. <laughs> I, it's, always, it's always funny when you crack yourself up. You're like, I hope somebody. I thought that you were going to stand up and just bow. And like, Thank you. Drop the mic. I've done it. I'm going to get a beer. I'm done for the day. <laughs> like, I'm not going to top that. Sometimes you just don't know where it comes from. You're like, thank you, universe, for that one. Because, but there is, you know, I mean, and, and we make another joke there that, that, you know, they say, they say, this is a, this is a worldwide problem. We say, God save the queen. Well, look at inflation, right? If, if inflation's 6% and all the queen's doing is saving, she's earning half a percent. You don't want God save the queen. It should be God invest the queen because you need investments <laughs> to save the queen. Yeah, we got to make money on our money. And the two asset classes that historically over long periods of time have done that are uh, our stocks and real estate, uh, period. Those are the two that have con- – there's other ones that have done it, but those ones over long periods of time are the, quote, crops that have have, have been your, your go-tos. Well, those crown jewels are – they ain't cheap. No, they're not. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you guys have all kinds of illustrations about – uh, sh- should one be saving and putting it towards mortgage or because mortgage rates are low, are you better off investing? And based on historical numbers, you can make more on your cash and have that grow and pay down your debt later. But um, yeah, all kinds of great stuff. You guys, I love to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you guys define success? Mm. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I define success as contentment, actually. Um, feeling like where you're, you are where you're supposed to be. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're, you're, um, putting out the value that you're supposed to be putting out. You're receiving the value that you're supposed to be receiving and you feel good about it. Um, so, um, that's a kind of a woogie, like a woo-woo definition of success. Um, but what I like about that definition of success is that it it decouples it from the sorts of things that our society views as markers of success, like um, money, possessions, power, influence, um, because those can be, they can be part of, of your success. They can be part of your contentment and being where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to do, giving out the value you're supposed to get out, give out and getting the value you're supposed to be receiving. But it, that's different for everyone. And for some people it's going to be, you know, making driftwood sculptures on the beach is success. And for some people it's going to be, um, running a fortune 500 com- company is going to be success. Um, and, uh, so that, that for me, is how I want to achieve success for myself. And for me, uh, and it's, it's going to paint very close to what Emily said. It's, it's living according to my values. And I had a coach a couple of years ago, really helped me do this. And it changed the way that I even structure my, my average day. Um, She asked without thinking about it too much, what age, you know, if I live a normal life, what age would I die? Uh, and I, without thinking about it, said 82. And she said, well, it's a year before that. You're 81 years old. And how do you want the world to see you? Like, what are the things that you're hoping people people see from you? And I said, well, I, I hope that I was an asset to my kids. They were asking me questions. I hope that I'm a great husband. And Cheryl and I are working together on projects that we love and traveling together we love. Uh, it's so fun. We we just love seeing the world together. So I hope that we've done a lot of that. I also hope that because I, I help organize with a nonprofit I'm part of here in town, I help organize a half marathon. And we have these 70 and 80 year old runners running 13 miles. And I always think they're such badasses. I'm like, I just want to be active. I would love to be active. And on that note, because we work online so much, And have a different community. I also really want to be part of my local community. You know, I want to help our town achieve whatever goals our community leaders have. And I want to be a part of that. So uh, I thought about that and I had all those things. And then Gina, my coach, said, uh, if you're doing those things at 81 and assuming it's not, you know, a life threatening disease that you're dying of, you just like a lot of people just kind of atrophy you 
retire and no longer have these goals. Like if you're doing those things at 81, how many more years do you think you'd actually live? And I go, oh, crap, I would probably live to 90. I would, I would, I would probably live another eight years if I did those things. And she said, what would you do with those eight years? And I said, well, I would continue those things. I'd, I'd be from 82 to 90. I'd be a part of my community. I'd help my kids and my family. I'd tr travel a hell. Cheryl, Cheryl and I would travel a lot. We would, you know, and, and I went through really those same things I said. And then Gina brings down the hammer like a coach will and said, <laughs> why would you wait? Why are you not doing those things now? So for me, I have rearranged my schedule and my days to do those things now. And because of that, I eat healthier. I focus on exercise more. And what's amazing is Andy, with all those things, my business results have been better. And, and in nowhere in those goals was my business, right? <laughs> the, my business stuff was not any of those things. My business results have been better. My, my, my marriage has been, it was good before. It's great. Now my relationship with my kids has been great. And, and I take part in my community. So that, that to me is success. If I continue to live that line, I think I'm, I'm doing what I should be doing. Very well said. I hope that you being less focused on your business and it doing better doesn't say something about <laughs> what you're doing when you're at work. <laughs> That's another question for your coach. Right. Yeah. Yeah. My whole team is like, thank goodness he's not around so much. <laughs> Why are they so productive when you're not there? No games, no board games. That's exactly. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, thank you guys. Thank you for sharing the lessons and the stories and uh, inspiring people to look at their money and to not be intimidated by their money, to actually get in entertained by their money where possible. Tell everybody, I, I, I actually don't know, what date does the book drop and tell people where to follow you and find out more December 28th because it's part of penguin random houses, new year's new year, new you. I don't know what they're calling it, but that's what I'm calling it. Uh, it's their, it's their new you, new you, their new year, new year's you thing. Boy, I can't even say it, but um, yeah. And uh, it's, it's going to be available um, anywhere books are sold. If you want to buy it online, um, you know, all the usual suspects, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, bookshop.org, uh, you can order it that way. Uh, you can also get it at any physical bookstore um, that, uh, that you want to go to. Um, and then you can find us. Um, we're very online. Um, my, my website is emilyguybirkin.com. And then I'm also on Twitter way more than I should be. Um, I really like it there. <laughs> Uh, so come say hi. And my uh, tr Twitter handle is at Emily Guy Birkin. And uh, I will also say that, you know, this whole project, as we talked about, started at Powell's Bookstore. And I love independent bookstores. So and these places are disappearing. So I would love it if that's people's first choice. Go buy it from an independent bookseller where you can hang out and get inspired like I did by the Hardy Boys. But um, but also, if you're in the spot where I was when when I began my financial journey, and I'm, you know, digging through the car cushions to find 82 cents to put gas in a car that I wasn't sure how I was going to make it um, just to get home that day. Uh, if you're in that spot, then the library is a great place. You won't be able to dog ear it initially like I did the Hardy Boys Detective Manual, but read it in the library. And then later on, when you build your first Benjamin, then go buy it and dog ear the hell out of it. Go support your community bookstores. Amen. Okay, Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Emily. Thanks so much, Andy. Thank you very so, much. So fun as always. So what was your favorite Inspired Money moment? I like how Emily and Joe make money fun and approachable. No matter where you are, I'm sure that you can do better with your money. Maybe you can save more, make more, invest or give more. Wherever you are right now, pick one focus area, set goals, and see what you can do over the next few months. If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment, let me know by posting a comment below. Thank you for watching to the end. Take just a minute to subscribe to my email that goes out every two weeks. The Runnymede Investment Team highlights data, news, and events that we think are worth sharing. Subscribe at inspiredmoney.fm slash newsletter. It's free and informative. Thank you so much for joining me on this mission. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens. <laughs>